Good afternoon and welcome to Live at Four on this Thursday. At least it didn't snow today. No, that's true. It felt a little bit warmer, did it? Or maybe we're just no, getting used to it. No, I think it got it. into the upper 20s. Yeah. I don't think we <laughs> This conversation sounds point. like a sitcom, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It would be funny if it weren't so sad. I know, if it weren't true. All right, here's what's making news on this Thursday. At least two people are dead following a shooting this morning at a California high school. The first public impeachment hearings are in the books. How lawmakers are using yesterday's hearings as they prepare for tomorrow's. And we're only a month and a half away from the new year and new decade. How a Madison neighborhood is already preparing for the 2020 census. Let's take a look outside today. It was cloudy, but it felt a little bit milder. Yeah, they, oh, okay. oh, look at that. A little surprise on Lake Monona. <laughs> the clouds making a difference out there, keeping the temperatures down. Dana's in the backyard. Did we hit the freezing point? Uh, not quite in Madison. Now, right now, we do have a little bit of a break in the clouds. That's a good news. Here's a live look from our WIC TV sky cam. Still a lot of cloud coverage, but I am seeing a little bit of sun right now. Overall temperatures uh, throughout southern Wisconsin have been hovering in the upper 20s, close to 30 in Bell, but in La Crosse, we're in the low 30s. They're getting a lot more sun up there right now. Uh, and just in the last few hours, as we have had a little bit of a breakup in this cloud coverage, our temperatures have climbed just a few degrees. Now, overnight, we'll drop into the teens again. Breeze staying pretty light for us, just a few uh, miles per hour. Heading into tomorrow, we are expecting a little more sunshine, so that should help our temperatures climb closer to the mid 30s for afternoon highs. But we'll take a closer look, of course, at that forecast for Friday and the weekend in just a few minutes. Right now on the roads, we don't have any major delays. Here's the Beltline Bright at Verona. East and westbound seem to be going along OK at this time, though the eastbound side uh, going just just a little bit slower than usual. On the westbound side, though, shouldn't have any major hiccups uh, around Janesville. No major stop and go spots at 39 and 90 should be smooth all the way through the state line, though it will take you just a little longer than usual to get from Sun Prairie to downtown about 18 minutes this evening. All right, Daniel, check back in a few minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dana. First at four, there's breaking news just into the Channel 3000 Alert Center. The Juneau County Sheriff is investigating a possible homicide in the village of Nesita. Just about an hour ago, Sheriff Brent Olison said that 26-year-old Jason Daly of Nesita died of blunt force trauma. His significant other, 27-year-old Crystal Ferris, is in custody on a probation hold in the Juneau County Jail. Daly was found dead Tuesday after police received a call for a welfare check. We'll have more on this developing story on Channel 3000 and on News Free Now at 5. Shots were fired today at a high school north of Los Angeles. At least two people have died and three others are injured. The suspected gunman is in custody. Marine Austin has the latest. Students filed out of Saugus High School with their hands in the air after gunshots rang out on the Santa Clarita campus. The suspected shooter, himself a student. He is identified as a 16-year-old male whose birthday is today. Two of the victims have died, a 14-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl. We went into protocol, turned off all the lights, locked all the doors, barricaded all the doors. Senior Luis Rubio was in his first period class when it started. I wasn't expecting this today, that I was, I never got to say goodbye to my parents this morning. The suspect was brought to the hospital in grave condition. Detectives have reviewed the video at the scene, which clearly show the su subject in the quad, withdraw a handgun from his backpack, shoot and wound five people, and then shoot himself in the head. In the minutes after the shooting, students were treated in the school's courtyard while deputies evacuated the campus. It's like a big balloon pop, but like super loud, and then like everyone started running, and like it was really scary. Parents have been streaming to school since the first reports. Now, evacuations have been orderly, but reuniting with families has been slightly chaotic. It was terrifying and not knowing, you know, what was happening, not hearing from your child. It's the most terrifying thing in the whole world. Witnesses near the school were shocked at what they saw. I was going, coming out of my house to go get my coffee, and I saw all kinds of kids running up the street, you know, screaming, crying, yelling. Many hugs and tears here as friends and families come together in what had been considered one of L.A.'s safest suburbs. Marin Austin, CBS News, Santa Clarita, California. And the suspect has been identified as Nathaniel Berhal. His mother and girlfriend were brought in for questioning. 
Well, Northside leaders are trying a new face-to-face -face approach to drum up support for the 2020 census. Rose Schmidt is here to explain how, Rose. Yeah, well, if you, you live or are connected to the north side, enjoy talking to your neighbors and need an extra gig for a few hours a week, an outreach worker might be the position for you. The North Side Planning Council wants to hire between four and six outreach workers whose job will be to get more families to fill out their census forms next year. The data helps determine representation and how federal money is distributed. The North Side has several pockets that are considered hard to count, like people of color, low income and immigrants. Part of the area had as low as 77 percent of people return their census forms in 2010. We find that lots of immigrants and people of color and low-income residents really struggle um, with trusting institutions. Census, um, along with all of the national hype <laughs> and uh, challenges around it, is just another um, manifestation of an institution that some folks are going to struggle to trust. So our goal is to help bridge that. The invitation to take the 2020 census will come to your mailbox in the beginning of April and all of the information is confidential. Outreach workers, which are different from federal census workers, will help with community meals, meetings and events where computers will be provided to fill out those forms. The positions are paid for through a city grant of $20,000 for between three and six hours a week and it actually pays $15 an hour, so quite a lot. Not a bad gig. Not a bad gig. All right, Rose, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rose. Former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick added his name to the ballot for the New Hampshire primary, officially joining the 2020 Democratic presidential race. One of the nation's first black governors, Patrick is positioning himself as a moderate candidate who can bring the country together. Ahead of his announcement, he called uh, the 63-year-old the called his senator, Elizabeth Warren, to tell the progressive candidate that he is running as well. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg hasn't announced his candidacy, but has recently filed to be on the ballot in Alabama and Arkansas, states that vote in the key Super Tuesday primaries. Ten Democratic hopefuls have qualified for next week's debate in Atlanta, Georgia. Deval Patrick will not be on that debate stage. As members of the House prepare for another public impeachment hearing tomorrow, leaders of both parties are doubling down on their positions. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi leveled new accusations against President Trump a day after the first public impeachment hearing examined his dealings with Ukraine. While Republicans elevated their calls to hear from the whistleblower and President Trump took to Twitter to do the same. I'm not going to vote for any resolution that denies the president the ability to confront his accuser, which is the whistleblower. The bribe is to grant or withhold military assistance in return for a public statement of a, uh, uh, of a fake investigation. Former Ukraine Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch testifies publicly tomorrow. Multiple State Department officials have testified that she was ousted after a smear campaign likely directed by the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Rocket attacks continued between Palestinians and Israelis today despite a ceasefire. Militants in Gaza fired rockets into Israel just hours after the ceasefire was declared to end two days of intense cross-border fighting. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack and it is not clear if it will impact the Egyptian brokered truce. We eliminated uh, the terrorist that was in charge of uh, the recent actions against Israel. The fighting erupted Tuesday after an Israeli airstrike killed a senior commander in the Islamic Jihad and targeted another commander in Damascus. There have been no reports of Israeli casualties, with at least 34 Pal Palestinians being killed, including a family of eight that was buried today in Gaza. Madison police say they are looking for a group of teenagers involved in a carjacking on the west side. This happened at High Point Road near the Marcus Point Cinema just before 9 o'clock last night. A 60-year-old man says he was sitting in his car when 14 males threatened him with a knife and stole his car. His car was found unoccupied a few blocks away. Well, just in time for the holiday season, the Second Harvest Food Bank gets a major donation. It comes in the form of a Wisconsin staple milk, but not the kind of milk that you're probably thinking of. Eric Franke is here to explain. Eric? Uh, Susan and Mark, not the typical gallon you might buy at the store. Most of you might be surprised to know that even here in Wisconsin, milk is very seldom donated. In part, that's because milk only lasts so long, of course. Many food pantries just don't have the 
refrigeration space. So Roundies and Kemp's teamed up to donate nine pallets of what's known as shelf-stable milk. These little eight-ounce servings are pasteurized at a facility in Cedarburg at a very high temperature. It can last for up to a year. Today, nine pallet loads, 28,000 servings, were donated to Second Harvest Food Bank of Southern Wisconsin. It's incredibly healthy. It's full and rich of, of protein. And so it's a product that we love to be able to provide the, to those that we serve. We just unfortunately don't get a lot of donations for it. So that's why this program is so important. It provides a great product to those that we serve. Yeah, this is part of the Kemp's Giving Cow program. Those eight ounce airtight cartons are not available for sale. Kemp's makes them only to meet the unique standards of food pantries and also school programs. A reminder, beyond today's donation, we are heading into the giving season. Second Harvest wants to remind people hunger is a year round challenge. They do accept your donations year round. Every dollar, every single dollar actually covers three meals to families in need. You can donate at secondharvestmadison.org. Absolutely. All right, Eric, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Still to come at four, tens of millions of Americans have had LASIK eye surgery. But now a former doctor with the FDA says the procedure should be banned. We'll find out why he feels that way when Live at 4 continues. You're watching News 3 Now, live at 4. Well, Motorola is bringing back the Razer flip phone, yay, with a twist. Last night, the company unveiled a new version of the legendary phone that has a foldable screen. It works with a specially engineered hinge. There's also a second quick view screen on the front, so when the phone is closed, you can still see pictures and texts and take pictures. The new Razer will cost $1,500 and will hit stores in January next year. Just when you thought you wanted one, right? 15, that's a lot of money. I have the old one. I know, you loved it too, loved didn't it, you? But I don't think $1,500 is 
worth that. Anyway, <laughs> using hip hop music as a way to teach vocabulary. It sounds unlikely, but one man has created a program that is helping students learn through something they do every day. English teacher Crystal Owens is using hip hop instead of dictionaries. She's using Rhymes with Reason, created by Austin Martin. It's a web-based program that finds SAT and Common Core vocabulary in song lyrics and then uses those lyrics as a teaching tool. A student might not necessarily think that Rihanna is going to teach them the word of the day. Um, or when they're singing along in the back seat to these songs that this is an SAT vocabulary word. I realize how much of a connection there was between this music that I knew and I loved and what was expected of me in the classroom. Rhymes with Reason is being used in at least 100 schools across the country. In one Detroit school, a teacher says after using the program for 10 weeks, he saw the pass rate for his students' standardized test scores go from 15 percent to 100 percent. Wow. Pretty amazing. An estimated 20 million Americans have undergone LASIK eye surgery. Surveys show high satisfaction, but one expert who wants back the procedure is campaigning to get it off the market. Since 1998, an estimated 20 million LASIK procedures have been performed. According to an FDA patient survey, more than 95% of the patients were satisfied with their vision after surgery. Still, the FDA's own website is filled with stories of serious complications. Patients report relentless eye pain, dizziness, detached retinas, and tell the agency, quote, LASIK ended my life, and this procedure needs to stop. Morris Waxler is a retired FDA advisor who now lives in Madison and had voted to approve LASIK. He now says that vote was a mistake. Essentially, we ignored the data on vision distortions that persisted for years. We re-examined the documentation, and I said, wow, this is not good. You really have to understand you're risking your only pair of eyes. Paula Coffer had surgery 19 years ago and is still struggling with complications. She started a LASIK complication support group on Facebook and quickly found she was not alone. Doctors stressed the importance of pre-surgical screening to make sure the patient is a good candidate for the surgery. On Wall Street, tech stocks pulled the markets down. The Dow Industrials fell a point and a half. Closing at 27,781, the NASDAQ was off three, but the S&P 500 managed a two and a half point gain. Well, the number of HIV cases in the general population has slowly declined over the last 10 years, but has increased slightly in men ages 13 to 29. More people will have access to a powerful tool for HIV prevention, thanks to an initiative from UW Health's HIV AIDS Comprehensive Care Program. It's called Prep It Up. Dr. James Sossman is the medical director of the program, and Shannon Ruth Lee is a PrEP navigator. Welcome to both of you. Thanks Good to see you. Thank you. So, Dr. Sossman, what does PrEP stand for? It really stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is really the role of using in uh, a medication called Truvada, which is uh, one of two medicines that are available that has uh, anti-HIV medicines in it taken once a day to prevent someone without HIV from getting HIV. So who are we, who are we targeting? What's the market here? What's the group? You know, we're targeting uh, uh, people that are sexually active, that uh, may be in a committed or uncommitted relationship, and that kind of have, uh, have a risk for uh, potentially acquiring HIV. So the safe sex is not required with this, or is it encouraged as well? We certainly would encourage safe, safe sexual practices. But a lot of uh, uh, individuals do that, or they may not do that all the time, and this is really helpful for that. Shannon, what is a PrEP navigator? So a PrEP navigator is somebody who can help folks access PrEP. Um, healthcare is really complicated for everybody, and so it's my job as a PrEP navigator to help folks understand their insurance, access financial assistance to pay for care, um, and just make sure they can find a doctor to get PrEP. Does insurance cover this drug? Yeah, Badger Care and most private insurance plans do cover. It's pricey. 
It is. It's an expensive drug, but um, it's a common misconception that cost is the major barrier. We can actually make it accessible and affordable if you come work with a prep navigator. Even if you don't have insurance, private insurance. Even if you don't have insurance, there are assistance programs out there. So how will this initiative make a difference? Our hope is that by spreading the word in this major way, we're going to get the awareness up of PrEP. Um, that's also a huge barrier that folks just don't know about it. So with PrepItUp.org and the advertisements that you'll see around town, we want folks to know PrEP is out there and it's accessible if you get in touch. Doctor, is it, is it alarming that the rate is going up for young young people? Yeah, it is. You know, we did make some improvement in the last 15 years. We had been at that time about 55,000 new HIV case, cases in the U.S. every year. Now we're down to about 39,000. But that rate uh, has been sitting there and pretty flat, plateaued. So we're really trying to increase this initiative. We think in PrEP alone, and there are other ways to also prevent HIV, but we think it's very effective. We think of the people that would be eligible, maybe have some risky uh, encounters or whatnot, we think only 10%, less than 10% are on it. And we think well over a million people in the U.S. would be eligible for PrEP. And you have to take this every day. It's not, okay, I'm going to go out tonight. I mean, it's a pill you have to take every day. Yeah, the guidance is to take it every day. It's most effective when you take it every day. And if you take it, it will prevent you from getting HIV? Is, is, am I understanding yes. that correctly? And people, you know, studies have been very, uh, very compelling. When people take it regularly, it can reduce their risk by about 99%. Wow. But it doesn't prevent other STDs. It does not. So that's what we are seeing a surge in that uh, for many factors. All right, so if people want more information, you can contact the UW Health. Actually, go to prepitup.org, okay. and you'll be able to get medically accurate info and reach out to us. And keep right. up your great work. Yep. Great Thank to you. see both of you. Thanks. Thanks. Exciting. Well, there's more to come at 4. We'll find out what's happening in the 608 this weekend. And then coming up tonight at 5, a woman says her flag supporting President Trump was vandalized. We'll hear from her coming up tonight at 5.
Take a look at this. Real life Iron Man and British inventor Richard Browning breaks a Guinness World Record for fastest speed in a body controlled jet engine powered suit. In Brighton Pier in the United Kingdom, Browning hit 85.60 miles an hour before landing on a beach. 85 miles an hour flying through the air on a jetpack. Sparks not included. Sparks, right? There's a lot going on up there. There is a lot going on. That is really cool. It's the future. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> That's how we're getting to work from now. We <laughs> well, put down the brand flakes. There is a new cereal in town. It's definitely the cereal you didn't know that you needed. <laughs> Tweakies. Oh, no. Yeah. Says oh, it's no. releasing its own cereal, flavored like the golden cream-filled sponge cake. The new cereal comes more than six years after a Twinkies shortage gripped the country in Zombieland, of course, the movie. Uh, it will be available nationwide starting in late December. No. Yo? And no. then, and Susan? I think it sounds delicious, actually. What? <laughs> <laughs> I have like a hundred other cereals I would eat before. Here. You know, I'm, a health, I'm a very healthy eater, but you know me and my sweet tooth. <laughs> yeah, but there's, I mean, so my question is, are they going to be flavored and crunchy, you know, like a Fruit Loop or Captain Crunch, or if they're just going to be mushy? Mushy. Good question. With a creamy filling in the center? I don't know. No, I'm thanks. sure the morning show. Will Just for a treat, point. not no. every day. No thanks. <laughs> a special occasion, you're breaking out the Twinkie cereal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's a big let's deal. Party. Um, yes. We should party if it gets above freezing. If it gets above freezing, so we're holding on to hope for tomorrow. <laughs> get a little more sunshine. Of course, today with the cloud coverage, I didn't quite get as warm as what we were hoping for. Look ahead for Friday and your weekend right after the break.
So today, of course, hoping to hop up into the 30s, but our visible cloud track tells the story as to why some areas were a little warmer uh, than others. Looking at this morning, a mostly cloudy sky throughout southern Wisconsin, but we started to see some clearing this afternoon towards La Crosse, and that's where temperatures were able to climb into the mid 30s today. The rest of the area, though, still holding on to the upper 20s right now, and of course, with sunset just about 12 minutes away, those temperatures are going to just steadily fall now. Doppler track is nice and quiet, just a little bit cloudy out outside. High pressure is centered to the southwest and it's pushing these clouds away. And once we finally get a little bit of clearing tomorrow, our high temps will be in the mid 30s and we'll get to enjoy some sunshine with no major systems moving in for Friday and for most of the weekend. We're not really looking at much precipitation. Of course, those light snow showers yesterday, thanks to a cold front that's now well off to the east. Not too strong of a cold front, otherwise our temperatures would be in a very different position for this afternoon. So our breeze from the west overnight, we gradually become mostly clear and that clearing sky is going to help our temperatures fall quite a bit overnight for tomorrow. Plan on a partly sunny sky, a little bit of sunshine in the afternoon, and it's going to help our temperatures climb right back on up. For Saturday, plan on the clouds to build right back on in, but for the daytime, we will stay pretty dry outside. It's not until Saturday night heading into Sunday that our next chance for some light flurries, not a lot of accumulation, just some light flurries comes through and we'll see maybe a little bit of rain mixing in heading into a Sunday afternoon. Overnight low temperatures will drop into the teens. It has to start to become clear and then we'll see our temperatures falling overnight. It is going to be a little cold out early in the day with that breeze 6 to 12 miles per hour. Overnight low in the teens, but when you're heading to the bus stop, still only in the low 20s. So layers definitely key for tomorrow. Gloves, hat, uh, I've really enjoyed in the teens. I'm not much of a, a scarf fan, but that's been my go-to so far this season to keep uh, my little face and my neck nice and warm. In the afternoon, still only climbing to the 30s with some sunshine. A little bit of deceptive sunshine, of course. If you're inside sitting by the window, it's going to feel a little warmer, but with a high of 36 in the afternoon in Madison, you'll likely still need the jacket and the little ones will certainly need to still stay bundled up. Partly sunny and not as cool outside with a light and variable breeze for the afternoon in Madison. Temperatures along the state line will be just a little higher, climbing to the upper 30s, so close to 40. Low 40s where we should be for this time of year towards Sun Prairie and uh, Sauk City in the mid 30s also for afternoon highs. But everyone's expected to climb above freezing. We'll have a clearer sky for tomorrow afternoon. That's going to help, of course, a little bit with the melting of the snowpack that we do have right now. Light flurry chances at night Saturday into Sunday. Sunday we have this chance for snow that might mix a little bit with some rain in the afternoon due to those temperatures climbing above freezing. Heading into next week, it does seem like we're going to slowly climb through the 30s and finally get into the low 40s by the middle of next week. So it is going to take just a little bit of time, but once we're in the low 40s, that will be the first time that we get close to average. Uh, than where we've been for quite some time. A few flurry chances are going to come through at night next week, uh, but overall we don't have any big systems coming in and we're not looking at any more opportunities for major snow accumulation at, at times, maybe just a dusting or, or a quarter of an inch or so at that. So it'll be nice, of course, to see some dry weather. I was driving home late at night and uh, saw a bunch of farm equipment, lights out, people still working yeah. out oh, yeah. fields. Be careful. It's, it's so cold and, and the snow is out there. And I felt so bad for those guys working that late. But they got to get the crops yeah, in. They, they, have to, behind. they have to get it done. Yeah, yeah. A lot of folks really behind right now. And so. for everybody else, then it'll be mild enough to actually enjoy the snow. Actually you know? enjoy the snow. And uh, by this weekend, of course, if you do still have outdoor stuff to do, or I know my neighbors are trying to put up their Christmas lights. That's what I think I'm going to do, too. <laughs> Knock get it out it now. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right, Dana. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, Dana. 60 years ago, TV audiences entered the twilight zone <laughs> for the very first time. Chris Martinez takes a look back at the iconic CBS show and its lasting legacy on television. You're traveling to another dimension. In the fall of 1959, television viewers were taken to a dimension as vast and timeless as infinity. Your next stop the Twilight Zone. Six decades later, The Twilight Zone remains one of TV's most impactful shows. What in the name of everything holy is going on? Twilight Zone was basically the first television genre series, and I think it was the forerunner to a lot of things. Dan Holloway is Variety Magazine's executive editor for TV. He says the program created by Rod Serling, which used tales of science fiction to confront many social issues of the time, still remains relevant today. When you go back and look at that program again, it's... Uh, 
it's really it's really fascinating how well it still resonates. The original Twilight Zone aired on CBS for five seasons beginning in 1959, but that was far from its only run. The traveling to another dimension. The show would be resurrected three more times in the 80s, early 2000s, and most recently this year on CBS All Access. You'll have to take a dark detour. Jordan Peele serves as both executive producer and host. He spoke about the show on CBS Sunday Morning and how, and like the original, this version is using storytelling to confront modern hot-button issues. When, when an audience is brought into an engaging story that sets their imagination going that uh, they'll be left afterward to think about what it's about. The show's creators promise to bring fans even further into the Twilight Zone in the reboot's second season, which should arrive sometime next year. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Los Angeles. What was the episode that scared you to death as a kid? It was the William Shatner was on a plane and there's a monster <laughs> monkeying with the engine and no one else could see it but him. <laughs> You couldn't sleep? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then the, the, the aliens, they had the cookbook, How to Serve Man. Oh, yes, that's what it was. That's what it was. In it's a cookbook! <laughs> in Stop! A, in honor of the show's anniversary, CBS Home Entertainment will be showing six digitally restored episodes of the original Twilight Zone in more than 600 theaters across the country. That includes here in the Madison area. It's showing tonight at 7 o'clock at both Marcus Theaters as well as the New Visions Theater in Fitchburg. Bring back some terrible childhood <laughs> memories. Still to come in four, Consumer Reports is out with its annual car reliability list. We'll find out what brands stand out and which ones came out on the bottom. That's when Live at Four continues.
buying a car is one of the biggest investments that you can make. So who makes the most reliable cars? Consumer Reports annual car reliability survey has just been released. Earlier today, we talked with Mike Quincy, an automotive reporter at Consumer Reports. First off, how does Consumer Reports determine the reliability of a car? Well, Consumer Reports uh, does surveys with it with its members, and the, the latest automotive reliability survey that came out, we have uh, over 400,000 experiences from people that uh, that subscribe and, and are part of Consumer Reports, and that makes up our new car uh, reliability predictions. So I understand you surveyed 30 different brands. Which ones were the most reliable cars? Well, no big surprise here. Uh, the, the most reliable brands generally tend to come from Japan. Um, we're talking about Lexus, Mazda, Toyota, but some, some of the surprises were that the Korean brands such as Genesis, Hyundai, and Kia are really closing the gap. And it's certainly the good news if you're rooting for the home team is that Dodge finally cracked into the top 10. But only one American manufacturer in the top 10. That is true. Uh, you know, it, it's always kind of a mixed bag when Consumer Reports looks at his uh, at our annual reliability survey. Uh, we're finding that that the, the domestics they make some strides in some areas, and they uh, they kind of fall back on other areas. Which were some of the brands that missed the mark and were the least reliable in your survey? Well, as, as you know, we talked about the, you know, the good news from Detroit is Dodge. The bad news from Detroit is Cadillac. Cadillac actually came in dead last out of the 30 manufacturers, uh, which, you know, is unfortunate. Uh, a, a, a brand that is not necessarily surprising is Alfa Romeo. They have not done well in Consumer Reports reliability surveys. But, but there is one brand on there from Japan who you wouldn't think would be so bad, and that would be Acura. They also were in the bottom. That is surprising. Uh, cars in general, though, are becoming more reliable, aren't they? The mechanics and so the electronics that are mixing up some of these uh, car manufacturers. Well, that's, uh, there's always kind of good news and bad news when it comes to automotive technology. The good news is that in-car electronics and, and navigation systems and, and electronic climate systems and safety equipment especially has never been better. The bad news is that a lot of these in-car electronics and infotainment systems are causing big, big problems in Consumer Reports reliability surveys. Uh, the engines and transmissions are getting more sophisticated and more fuel efficient, but they're also tur turning out to be pretty problematic. How important is reliability overall to people when they're making a decision about buying a car? Well, when it comes to buying a car, it's it's the, the second highest or largest purchase that people make outside of, of buying a home. So uh, Consumer Reports likes to do is, is get this information to its members so they can decide on buying a vehicle that is going to hold up over time. And instead of you, you know, buying, buying a first model of your car, especially a redesign or a newly introduced model, Consumer Reports reliability surveys are showing that these models especially are being problematic. And you know what good is it to shell out all this money for a car if you're constantly bringing it back to the dealer to get it fixed? But reliability remains on the top of shopping lists for most people. Uh, as it should. I mean, Consumer Reports has always been big proponents of, of good reliability. I think uh, we've really pushed the industry to make cars more reliable. We also want uh, people to seriously consider getting as much safety equipment as they can afford. Uh, we're big fans of forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking. Uh, these are becoming more and more prominent in cars, and the data is showing that uh, it's helping to reduce accidents. Good information. Mike Quincy from the Always Reliable Consumer Reports. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Interesting reading. It was always. an interesting result, yeah. Well, it is Friday Eve, <laughs> as we like to call it around here. When we come back, we'll find out what's happening in the 608 this weekend. Joel Patnod from Madison Magazine will join us when Live at 4 continues. There he is. Hi, Joel.
sunset was just a little bit ago and just the roads seem to be going along just fine on the belt line though there is something we're keeping an eye on on 39 and 90 northbound actually just outside of county highway and uh, there is an accident on the northbound side the right lane is blocked so that's causing traffic to back up uh, for a few miles on 39 a little bit of slow down there and then once you get past the accident of course then speeds start picking right back on up the eastbound and westbound sides of uh, seeing a little bit of a slowdown there around Park Street and then things do improve a little bit on the belt line at least the closer that you get to 90 around downtown Shanesville it should be just fine now to get from Janesville to the belt line though that's usually around about 27 minutes it's, it's going to take you closer to 43 minutes though due to that accident Sox City to Middleton about 16 and from some prey to downtown closer to 18 minutes this evening that's a quick look at traffic all right Dana thank you it is the weekend almost in the 608 and here with a look at what's going on around town this weekend is Madison Magazine associate editor Joel Patnod hi Joel hi, Joel. hi. Chris Christopherson is in Madison. He is, you know, <laughs> one of Greece. the last of a generation, uh, those outlaw country singer-songwriters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and he's had, you know, a long career, and not just only in music, he's had 30-some albums, uh, multiple Grammys, but he's also appeared in 70 films. Yeah, big movie star. Yeah, and I don't know if you were aware, but he got a Golden Globe for, for Best Actor in A Star Is Born. The, the 1976 version, <laughs> yeah. exactly. But he's 83 and he's still touring, uh, he's wow. still singing, and he will be at the Barrymore uh, with the Stranglers, which was the, um, the late Merle Haggard's band. So that, that should be something else. Good for him. At 83, still yeah. touring. Yeah. That's inspira inspiring. It's time to get into the holiday spirit, aluminum style. Yeah, exactly. The aluminum Christmas tree. Uh, it is the 60th anniversary. And for that occasion, uh, the 60th anniversary, I should say, of the Aluminum Specialty Company of Manitowoc introducing the Evergleam aluminum tree. And to mark the occasion, the Wisconsin Historical Museum on the square is bringing back, back a popular exhibit it's, it's had, uh, Evergleaming. And it features some of the two dozen aluminum trees in the State Historical Society's collection. And museum visitors will even be able to take pictures of themselves in a replica 1959 living room <laughs> with one of the aluminum Christmas trees. So you know where to take your family photos yeah. this year. Yeah, Mark has one. I have one of these. Oh, do you really? In the original box. With the you original receipt. So you haven't taken it out and put oh, it yeah, out? Oh, yeah, I put it up all the time. <laughs> and you have the light that, the, the that goes light. under oh, the rotating light? Yeah. yeah. I'm always looking for one at every garage sale I go to. They're getting I rare. I, they're getting hard yeah, to find. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful exhibit. Okay, little holiday show, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Exactly. Uh, this is one of a few kids' musicals this weekend. Uh, this is at the Overture Center. It's the live-action adaptation of the beloved TV special, so it comes complete with actors dressed up as the recognizable Rudolph, the abominable snow monster, and the inhabitants of the Island of Misfit Toys. Uh, two shows at Overture Hall at 2 and 7 on Saturday. That should be a lot of fun. It yeah. should be. It, the pictures look great. And we have more, more music on stage. There is. Uh, there's some community theater. In fact, at the Verona High School Performing Arts Center, there's two musicals with all kid casts. Uh, being staged back to back. We are Monsters and Disney's Frozen Junior. Uh, unless, however, you already have tickets to both, uh, catching them um, back to back is not possible given that the Frozen tickets are sold out. However, uh, the We Are Monsters show tickets are still available and that's a great fun musical, uh, less than an hour long, so perfect for those kids um, and adults with shorter attention span. Yeah, good for the little ones. <laughs> Lots going on as usual, getting into the holiday spirit. Exactly. All right, Joel, thank you. Thank you. There's more on, there, get all the events, Madison Magazine on sale now. And we'll have a final check of your forecast coming up. Ready roll playback.
Well, it's gradually it's warming up. Yeah, slowly, slowly. <laughs> Today, of course, we didn't quite get enough sunshine to really help those temperatures climb. Here's a live look right now, uh, getting a nice glow. Though sunset was just a little bit ago, and now it's just going to start to get colder outside. Still holding on some cloud coverage right now, though, but that's not going to include any moisture along with it. We're at 27 in Madison and in Janesville. Towards La Crosse, though, where they saw a little bit of sun this afternoon, those temperatures were able to make it to the low 30s. So our forecast just a little bit lower than what we're going for this afternoon, but that's all because of the clouds. Now, as we look over the next 12 hours, our temps, of course, are going to fall overnight. We'll be landing in the upper teens for early tomorrow morning, and tomorrow we'll be starting the day with partly cloudy sky, so we'll keep that partly sunny sky throughout the afternoon, and that'll help us get above freezing in the mid to upper 30s oh, for Friday afternoon. Great. That'll be really nice. Yeah. And this weekend right now, uh, we'll get uh, those temperatures staying consistent in the mid 30s. So it's just nice to not be bitterly cool. That yeah, once you get rid of the snow, it's going to help too, because that keeps the temperature. Yeah. It does. It does. It helps insulate a little more. So the snow melting off is going to help us next week climb on up. Oh, that's we'll good. We'll have news. a white Christmas. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah. Just, I don't don't promise things. I don't want a white Thanksgiving. The odds are in our favor. I don't want a white Thanksgiving. <laughs> we don't want a white Thanksgiving. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. All right. Thanks, Dana. Tomorrow, you're alive at four. Our news hounds have the best animal stories of the week. And our Michael Bruno heads to McFarland High School to check out their production of Mamma Mia. That's coming up tomorrow on Live at Four.